Program number 91. Three, two, one. Hog producers have been selling overfat hogs on the open market for less than the cost of production for the past seven months. On today's Here's Info, Merle Sunken, head of NFO Hog Division, is talking with Dr. Gene Frutrell, an economist from Iowa State University, about this dilemma. How does these heavy hogs that we're producing today over, we'll say, the 235 to 240, 45 pound hog, does this cost a producer uh, extra money to produce this type of hog? Well, I think it uh, certainly does, Merle, because the feed intake does go up at, at heavier weights. It continues to uh, to increase, and at the same time, the uh, the growth rate on the hog slows down. So, feed requirement per pound of gain does increase, and it tends to keep on uh, increasing as you go to those heavier weights. So, I think uh, right now the uh, the cost of gain is relatively high with, with feed costs uh, a little higher than they've been sometimes in the past. And uh, with hog prices down in the 36 37 $38 range, the value of that added gain is relatively low. The government figures that we have more uh, pork in cold storage right now than ever before. Some of the hogs can go to 250 pounds or 255 even and still yield a desirable carcass, not be adding a, a lot of additional fat but many of them can't, and uh, that extra weight does add to, uh, to the fat on those hogs, and it's a lower-valued item, and right now, as you point out, we've got a lot of pork in cold storage, particularly of, of pork bellies, uh, and some slow movement of, of those uh, bellies, and the, the value is fairly low right now, so we just don't need to uh, be producing additional fat, uh, certainly at this time, but it has a negative impact, I think, on the movement of the product uh, at the retail level, and it's costly to put on that fat. We had an average uh, barrel and gilt uh, weight now of around 250 pounds. If that was 10 pounds lighter at around 240, that would reduce our, our current output of pork by about 4%. And I think we both know that 4% less pork would, uh, would surely have a, a favorable impact on hog prices. Or the producer really himself could be helping himself by lowering his weight, uh, having better feed efficiency, and taking 4% of the, of the pork off the market immediately. Well, I think that's exactly right, Merle. You could, they could be uh, lowering costs and uh, improving the, uh, the potential for the market to improve and at the same time uh, producing a, a product that would probably be more desirable at the retail level for the consumer. Economist Gene Futrell at Iowa State University and Merle Sunken, NFO Hog Director. Their advice seems reasonable and simple for hog producers and consumers. Don Mack for NFO Here's Info. And that's something to think about. Number 92, 3, 2, 1. Today we're going to visit with Bob Arndt, who is head of the Growth and Maintenance Division of the National Farmers Organization. They've been holding important meetings in quite a number of states. Where all, Bob? Bill, we've had meetings in South Dakota, Iowa, Minnesota, Missouri, Illinois, and we'll be going into Indiana and Ohio later this week. You folks use the expression sell side, buy side. Why don't you explain that? Well, it's nothing more than putting agricultural marketing into perspective. You know, every, every marketing system has two sides, the buy side and the sell side. And farmers and ranchers all belong to the same side of the marketing system, the sell side. And what we're attempting to do is to get the farmers and ranchers to understand that a marketing system is really nothing more than uh, terms of sale and a physical means of getting the product from the seller to the buyer. And you have to have influence, the seller has to have influence, to be successful in that marketing system. Uh, pointing out that an individual farmer really has no influence when he faces a multi-billion dollar buy, buy side Whereas if he will join together with National Farmers Organization in, with other producers, his influence will match the multi-billion dollar buy side and therefore uh, be able to extract the dollars he needs from the marketplace. Sounds to me as though you'll get some pretty good insights going at it that way. Excellent. It's, a very, uh, it's very good insight for farmers and ranchers. It's something that they just don't think about unless uh, we talk about it with them. Now, you've held these meetings in seven states, I think you said. What next? Where do you go next? Well... Uh, we're going to continue having the buy-side, sell-side meetings, and we'll tie them together with commodity programs. 
so that we can put the total package together for farmers and ranchers to get a, a real understanding of this whole agricultural marketing system. I see. They're held in conjunction with the actual commodity, putting the commodity together. We will be holding them uh, in conjunction with commodity uh, departments uh, from now on. Do you have some material that people could uh, get about all this? Yes, if they will ask for the buy-side, sell-side brochures here in the National Farmers Organization, we'll get, that, uh, we'll get it out to them. We also have a 14-minute video that uh, we've just completed that is a very good video to give the basic understanding of what we're talking about. I've been talking with Bob Arndt, who is head of the Growth and Maintenance Division of the National Farmers Organization. Phil Allen for NFO's Here's Info. And that for today is something to think about. Number 93, 3, 2, 1. Rainy Neese, Vice President of the National Farmers Organization, recently addressed the Future Farmers Annual Spring Banquet at Corning in Adams County, Iowa. You can still work out there at the farm and generate a profit, and there are ways to do that. But one of the biggest obstacles that we as individuals, and if you will, even as young as some of these FFA leaders are, we have to be ready to make a change. And in order to be profitable today, that young man who goes back to the farm is going to farm so much different than my dad did and that I am farming today, it will be unbelievable. To the FFA students, Anise emphasizes good management practices for a modern farm. You've got to know exactly every day what it's costing you to produce. You've got to know what your break-even is. You've got to have good balance sheets, financial statements, which include P&Ls or profit and loss statements, and you've got to have cash flow statements that tell you exactly where you are. And the subject not just of managing the farm, but managing risk. The time the farmer has got to look at what that market is going to be at the time he locks in his input costs. And he's got to be an astute enough businessman to look out into the future and say, hey, I understand risk, but at the same time, using these different scenarios, if in fact I can achieve this price in the market today for delivery three months, six months, as much as a year in advance, I'm ready to lock in a portion of what I produce right now. And grain farmers, if they're astute business people, are already looking out in the March of 1990 and already selling part of their corn and their soybean crop and even their wheat that they haven't even harvested yet or even put in the ground in the case of corn and beans. That's how critical it becomes. That's the type of aggressive marketing programs that producers will have in the future because they will be required to have those if for no other reason than the banker when you walk in that front door, if you expect to get a loan, is going to say to you, unless you have those kind of marketing strategies in your hip pocket, I can't loan you the money. Rainy Nice also expresses optimism for the future of a young farmer. If we have a responsibility as adults, as parents, as leaders, it's to say to those young FFA people that are here tonight, there is a future in agriculture. And if it's not for you in policy, in biotechnology, or any other area, then look at the farm. Because there will be profitability at the farm gate, there will be viability, and there will be strength. And the farmers of tomorrow will have an ability to have input and say into what they get for what they produce. But most of all, they're going to be armed with the tools to do it. Rini Nice, Vice President of the NFO, addressing the annual Spring Banquet of Future Farmers at Corning, Iowa. Phil Allen for Here's Info. And that for today is something to think about. Number 94, 3, 2, 1. I'm having a conversation with Professor Ken Stone of the Extension Division of Iowa State University at Ames. He addressed this crowd of mostly business people at the town of Creston because a Walmart store is scheduled to come here and he was telling them about, well, he showed all kinds of charts. One was that they increased the trade area and the overall amount of uh, sales increases in a town. And then he started to get a little deeper and showed what the effect is on stores that are in the direct line of competition with Walmart. They don't do so well. Then, Professor Stone, you said to this crowd that there are a number of things that they might do to cope with a Walmart. Yes. 
Could you go through that list? Well, I think the first thing I said was to recognize the fact that Walmart probably will enlarge the trade area for this town. There'll be more people yes. coming to town, and people need to figure out how to tap into those extra people coming into town and get them into their own stores. And they do that typically by offering complimentary merchandise, in other words, things that, that Walmart doesn't handle, uh, by perhaps offering more specialized services, uh, technical uh, advice, and, and special ordering, and perhaps home delivery and things of that nature. Uh, that still appeals to a lot of people. And uh, one thing I certainly wouldn't overlook is developing a better customer relations program and really treating that customer like we'd all like to be treated. Uh, sometimes we get a little lax in that area. And Walmart, for example, feels so strongly about it that they have a greeter at the door of every one of their stores acknowledging everybody's presence and seeing if they can help them anyway. Uh, we, a lot of us could take a lesson from that and improve our stores in that regard. You said you hadn't had especially good uh, experience in your surveys in noticing that local businesses cope with this very well. And that is the, the kind of hours they keep to accommodate customers in competition with Walmart. Yes, I was rather blunt about that. I said if uh, competing merchants are really serious about competing with this firm when it comes into town, they're going to have to give serious thought to staying open extended hours when the consumer can get there. Our, today's consumers have changed uh, a good bit over the consumer of 20 years ago. We have many more households where both spouses are working outside the household or we have single parent households where those people can't get to these towns and shop uh, from 8 to uh, 8, 5.30 or whatever and they need those extended hours and uh, it's a tough one to crack. Uh, we've had a hard time. We've had individual merchants that have done it and been very successful at it, but it's hard to get a whole town to do it. Do Walmart stores uh, typically stay open in the evening hours during the week? Yes, they do. They, uh, to the best of my knowledge, they all stay open until uh, at least 9 o'clock or somewhere in that vicinity. That's Professor Ken Stone, an economist with Iowa State University in the Extension Division. I'm Phil Allen at Creston, Iowa, and that for today is something to think about. Number 95, 3, 2, 1. For this week's commentary, we revisit the Joe Paris report. Joe is one of NFO's top organizers. He's been working in California, where the prices dairy farmers get are below the Minnesota-Wisconsin series price, which is supposed to be standard for price levels in the industry. One of the things that's happening out here is their price is running about a buck to a buck and a half under the M&W series price on any milk they've got going into manufacturing plants. The state of California just this week published their cost of production figures, and what they're getting is running about $2.50 a hundredweight below their cost of production. So uh, uh, they're, they're really concerned. As Joe Paris just reported, the California dairy farmers are a good example of the folly of working alone. It wasn't their folly. The West Coast is, in a sense, isolated from the rest of dairy production in the United States. It's a geographical problem. But the point to remember is that they are also some of the biggest individual producers anywhere in the country. And no matter how big they were in California, the handlers knew that they were not part of any structure representing them in the marketplace. And so they got paid less for their milk. And California isn't the only illustration that NFO can cite where regional prices of some commodity have lagged below national levels and didn't come up to where they should until the NFO moved in. Phil Allen for Here's Info. And that for today is something to think about.